Pan 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 Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. In the previous instalment, we discussed domestic labour and the problems of disparity, that is, that women typically do more housework, and invisibility, that men seem to overestimate the amount of housework that they do in relation to opposite sex couples. As we heard, Tom and Paulina's solution was to appeal to something called affordance perception, the idea that we literally perceive possibilities for action within our environments. Now, to begin this section, I'd like to get thinking about some of the ethics and solutions to this phenomenon. And in the paper you say, quoting you directly here, if Jack doesn't see the counter as to be wiped, then surely he cannot be blamed for failing to wipe it. Now, although I don't appreciate my name being dragged into this moral mess, is there a sense in which this quotation gets at something that's right? That is, perhaps men aren't morally blameworthy for being messy because they don't see the mess. Tom, how much sympathy should we have for this defense of messy men? I'd say very little. It's, a, it's an explanation, not an excuse. It might be true that what explains why you don't do something is that you didn't see it. But I think you can hold people responsible for what they see. So take a different example. If somebody's driving and dangerously drives through a red light and you ask, what are you doing? And they say, well, I just didn't see the red light. It's not much of an excuse. You don't then say, oh, right, well, if you didn't see it, that's fine. You know, I, it looked from the outside like you saw the red light and chose to go through it. But if you didn't see it, then no problem. No, we'd, we'd hold them responsible for not seeing it. We'd say, well, you should see it. You should be paying attention. You should be a better driver who's got their eye out on the, on the right things on the road. The same applies in the domestic setting. Right? We can say, Jack, you should have seen the crumbs on the counter. You should have seen that the bins needed taking out. So their invisibility to you is something you can be blamed for. It's interesting to me that you claim at some point in the paper that along the lines of what you're saying here, we can still reason our way into action. We can choose to change the way that we see things. I wonder, though, if in this line of thinking, it is still more difficult for men to do housework than women. When for one group, perceiving these affordances comes with little effort. And for the other group, i.e. men, it takes conscious effort and constant reminders. With everything else we have going on in our lives, how can we stop ourselves from falling into these same traps? Good question. So maybe there's a sense in which while a man is kind of making that transition into seeing all the jobs that need doing, it is harder because you're having to be quite deliberate about it. You haven't learned to see it. There's another sense in which things are a lot easier if you're a man, because if you don't see the jobs, they just don't bug you. They don't pull on your attention. So one of the things that we talk about in the paper is a more subtle kind of gender injustice, which isn't just to do with who does the jobs, but to do with how much the jobs bother you. So for a woman, not doing the job is itself a kind of burden, because if you can't help but see that the bin needs taking out and see that the crumbs need wiping, that's a kind of mental burden, even if you don't act on it. Whereas men who don't see those jobs are free of a kind of mental burden. So if we're talking about effort here, sure, maybe there's some extra effort required for men to learn to see these affordances. But I think that's dwarfed by the effort on the other side. Pauline, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on another strand of your question, which is it's hard for the individual. And it's true, it might be quite hard for the individual to have enough practice in order to acquire these affordances, right? So if you are parenting in a country that has no parental leave that applies to both parents, you only have maternity leave, it might be quite hard as a dad to spend enough time around your infant to kind of attune yourself to the nappy-changing affordances and the consoling affordances, simply because you're not provided enough opportunities to do these tasks. And so here we have to keep in mind that in changing affordances, it can't just be down to the individual. These affordances are learned in particular social settings and social settings might need to be changed in order for 
kind of widespread affordance change to come about. And it is really striking, for example, that countries which have introduced better provisions for fathers to take parental leave, they have seen the gender pay gap close. And one explanation for why the gender pay gap has closed is precisely that fathers do more care work in those countries. If we can reason our way into contributing to the household, rather than merely perceiving what we ought to do, does this weaken the impact of affordance perception on our actions? Furthermore, what, in the absence of affordance perception, would motivate us to perform such an action as, say, washing the dishes or doing the laundry? Simply a desire, belief path would do, right? You desire the dishes to be clean or you desire to do your job, you, you to, do, to do your share of the household work. And you believe that in doing the dishes, you could do a more equal share of the housework. And that is enough to motivate action in most cases. Affordance perception isn't the only source of motivation. It's not the only explanation for why we do things. And quite often, we have to consciously reason our way into what we need to do. So imagine a driver who's just learning how to drive. And imagine they're learning to drive in a very old-fashioned car, so they have to shift gears manually. Well, they might have to think about, oh, I now need to shift from second to third gear. When if they, Once they become more experienced, a more skillful driver, they won't have to think about it. They won't have to rely on the desire and the thinking about what gear am I now? Is the motor making a very loud sound? they will simply see that the gear needs shifting. So we don't need affordance perception to do a task. We very often do things without seeing affordances on them. And when we do so, we act on our beliefs, we act on our desires, we act on our intentions, we act on our plans. So all of those are available, even in the absence of affordance perception. Tom? Lucy and Paulina both mentioned parental leave a moment ago, and this is one of the solutions that you outline in the paper as like a, a societal change that perhaps could bring about a more even distribution of, of housework. And quote from the paper, you say, after the arrival of children, women shoulder the lion's share of caring work. At the same time, there is empirical work suggesting that fathers who take longer parental leave do more caretaking work well after the end of their parental leave. Why is it that you think that the distribution of domestic labor becomes fairer following a longer period of parental leave? Is it simply the matter of being exposed more frequently to the demands of housekeeping? Yeah, exactly. So if you want to change your beliefs about something, sometimes that can happen really, really quickly. You can just tell me something and now I've got a new belief. Altering perception is much slower. So you talked already about how in childhood, your perception of the world, your perception of affordances is shaped gradually over time. Well, in adulthood, that's the same. Right? If you're going to change your perception of the domestic environment, it's going to take time. And that includes um, perception of what needs doing in a childcare context. So with longer parental leave, you're going to train yourself to see those affordances for, for caring various other duties in a way that you couldn't get just in a few weeks or a few months. I might have laid a trap for you there, or I've laid you a trap and I'm going to fall in it to myself thinking that it's a trap. Because I wonder if this contradicts the point that you make at the start of the paper where you say that during the pandemic, these disparities in household work persisted. Like if they didn't work then, when everyone was locked indoors, men and women in these same-sex couples, and women were still doing the lion's share of the work, why should we think that just more time off work in terms of parental leave would help? Good question that Pauline is going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a really different setting. The pandemic setting was a very different setting from parental leave setting, right? In the parental leave setting, very often one parent takes over and the other goes to work. As a dad taking parental leave, you have no choice but to change those nappies. No one else is going to step in if you don't. Whereas the thing about the pandemic was that all of the sudden, both parents were at home, yet only one of them was habituated into seeing all of those things that needed to be done. 
So we should have expected the pandemic setting to play out exactly as it did. Hopefully, the pandemic setting provided an opportunity for some couples to rejig that perception a little bit. So maybe it's a misreading on my part, Ben, because I thought when it was longer parental leave for the male in the family, that they'd be taking that parental leave alongside the female and they'd be exposed to the sort of work that she was doing that he wasn't aware of before. And then he sees her doing these things, she asks him to do these things, and they become a part of his perception as well. Where it seems like you're suggesting, no, if the man has parental leave on their own, they're forced to do these things. And that's what's different about the pandemic. Do you want to come in on this point, Tom? Even in those cases where it's both a man and woman looking after a new child, a similar point applies because in that kind of context, you're taking parental leave to embark on the mission of looking after this child. And that's very different to the pandemic um, context where you've been sent home by a pandemic. Housework is not why you're at home. But does it occur to you to do the housework? No, because of this perceptual training that we've been talking about. So we, we've talked already about purpose and actually setting out on a mission. In a childcare context, if you're on parental leave, hopefully you're going to be setting out on the mission to look after the young child. Whereas in the pandemic context, it's very different because nobody was locked down to do housework. So there, the question of who does the housework is much more revealing. Gender inequality in domestic labour is something that negatively impacts myself and many women I know. We surely want this to change. As you rightly state, changing this disparity requires effort both at the individual and at the political level. What would change at the political level look like? And is there any motivation for those who hold political power to enact such change? Ah, that's a difficult one. I mean, it depends on the country a little bit, right? I think in the UK, this is part where the paper, where I started thinking about issues in the paper. That was the context where shared parental leave was introduced, but there was no incentive for fathers to take shared parental leave because it was just being deducted from the mother's share, from the other parent's share of the parental leave. And that share, that the parental leave as a whole was not particularly generous to begin with. Even though the possibility existed, the take-up was very minimal. So in that context, increasing parental leave in general would be helpful. In some countries, a father has to take a particular amount of parental leave or that parental leave is gone. It's not the option for the mother to take it over. It doesn't exist. So these are kind of some policy options. You know, when it comes to childcare, to encourage fathers to take parental leave, these are policy options that exist. But what the right policy option is, that's going to depend quite a lot on the, on the particular setting. Tom, do you have any thoughts on how people impact on each other's affordance perception? This is a question that you and Paulina raised towards the end of the paper. It's something that we might want to go away and consider and reflect on. It's been, if I recall correctly, around a year and a half since the paper first came out. And so I wonder if you've had time to reflect on this. I'm sure you've been asked it before. We know that most men don't live in squalor when they live on their own. So what changes when they enter into a household with that extra pair of hands? Do you think they then reduce their perception of these, uh, these objects and their affordances? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So, you know, we, we don't want to predict that a man living on his own is going to live in squalor, right? But it might still be the case that he sees the task as needing doing later than a woman living on her own would because of those differences in upbringing. But then if you've then got a couple living in the same household, an imbalance might emerge. Why is that? Well, this is where gender roles do come in. And perhaps it's easy to sink into that traditional gender role, even if it's not one you endorse, and then gradually your perception changes. So Paulina started off with the example of the stay-at-home dad who then went to work, whose perception changed because of his different role. That can happen all the time. So you might enter into a different sex relationship and your perception of the domestic environment changes because as a man, maybe you're just implicitly leaving it more to your female partner to perform that role, even though it's not something you, you think they ought to be doing. And your perception changes accordingly. On gender role perception, is there any way we can apply affordance perception theory to same-sex couples? After all, if we see similar problems, i.e. imbalances, in same-sex couples, 
then this ought to make us question whether gender, as you hold, can account for this disparity. Yeah, this is a really good question. Unfortunately, there's a lot less data on distribution of domestic labour in same-sex couples. But the data we do have suggests that the gaps are significantly less than they are. So that kind of speaks to what we've been talking about, that gender plays an important role here. But the fact that there are still gaps suggests that gender isn't the only role. Right? If gender was the only role, then we'd expect there to be no gaps. Right? But of course, you know, the human mind is a complicated thing. Affordance perception and the gender shaping of affordance perception is part of what's going on here. But there could be loads of other stuff as well. So the way you perceive affordances is shaped by your unique life experience. So you might have two women or two men who perceive the domestic environment very differently because of different upbringings. It isn't strictly a gendered upbringing, but it's still different. Right? So affordance theory still applies there. But in order to predict how someone's going to perceive their domestic environment, you're going to have to look at their specific childhood, their specific life, rather than just saying, well, it tends to be that men get this kind of training, women get that kind of training. Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to all of our domestically performing patrons for keeping the show in tip-top condition. In particular, a very special thank you to... They say he's allergic to dust bunnies. It's Jamie Lung. He doesn't wash his dishes, he just buys new ones. It's Joe Richardson. Given his choice of chores, he'll always drop the kids off at school. It's Matt Carrera. The juxtaposition of domestic virtue and primal mess. It's Christian Moyunki. Time for chores? No thanks. I think it's time for a hike. It's Walker Barnes. There's nothing hygienic about this boy. It's Michael Kisley. He loves doing handiwork. Just leave the fuse box on. It's Neural Surge. You'll find him in the kitchen, chopping up fresh leeks. It's Anthony Welsh. Her house is so filthy, it'll make you sick. It's Eliza Hughes. And last but not least, the only thing cleaner than his house is his mind. It's Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help us maintain a happy and healthy household, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. Paulina, Tom mentions there it'll be different when it's two women or two men. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on what happens when it's two women and two men in like a polygamous relationship. Is there just uh, limited data on that as well, as Tom said, with same-sex couples? Or do you see the, a difference in shift in the domestic roles of people when they enter into a polygamous relationship? I have no, no idea what happens. I think there's very, very little data on polygamous on household labor division and polygamous relationships. It's difficult to predict because you'd have to tell me more about if it's a traditional, you know, very religious polygamous setup, you would expect gender differences to arise in that setting. If it's a very liberal, um, you know, queer polygamous relationship, which comes from people who reject traditional gender roles, who've lived in queer circles for a long time. Who knows what happens? Possibly there might not be such disparities in that case. And I think in both cases, in the polygamous, but also in the same sex case, just to go back, I think the interesting data here is not just whether disparities exist, but for our purposes, it also matters whether if there are disparities, they also are invisible to one of the partners. Right, That's one of the marker where the affordance perception explanation becomes plausible. So we would love people to do studies on both differences in household labor in same sex or you know, queer couples and studies on the perception about the relative contribution to household and to see whether there are any systematic differences here. Your explanation of affordance perception accounts for the validity of two differing yet accurate perceptions of the same environment. You make the claim that two individuals can enter the same environment at the same time and yet perceive it differently. How can it be that the environment is two different things or in two different states simultaneously? That's a really interesting question. I think it's important that affordances are something that is relative to the individual. So take an example that isn't an affordance. Take the property of something being at eye level. 
right? Um, to a tall person, something's at eye level, and to a shorter person, it's not at eye level. There's nothing mysterious about that. We don't say, how can it be that this thing is both at eye level and not at eye level? It's because it's relative to the eyes of the person who's looking. It's no more mysterious with affordances. The top shelf is reachable by some people, but not reachable by others. Um, the ladder is climbable by some people, not climbable by others. You're perceiving properties relative to the skills you've got, the abilities you've got, and the body that you've got. So if we were to take this example specifically in the domestic setting, so say two partners perceive a kitchen, one perceives it as filthy and the other perceives it as fairly clean. How do the partners decide whose perception is more justified? Yeah, that's very interesting. It's not necessarily that one partner is perceiving it as more clean. It's just that they aren't noticing the job. So there's an interesting study in which men and women in couples were shown pictures of a scene and asked how messy that scene was. And interestingly, they tended to agree on that. Right? So that suggests that they're actually agreeing in their assessment of what does and doesn't count as messy. This is where the affordance thing is much more subtle because it's saying, okay, how much does that mess call out for you to do something about it? Right? That's something that a photograph in a psychology lab is not going to get you. Right? What matters is when you get home from work and open the door, does that mess call out for action? And that's where affordances come in. So if there's a disagreement, it's a much more subtle one about when a job needs doing, not whether it is actually messy or not. Mm, that's fascinating. What an interesting, interesting study. There's a feeling in the paper that maybe you give this off accidentally or deliberately, or maybe I'm reading into it a little bit too much, that this disparity of the housework between the man and the woman is morally undesirable. What would you say to those Paulina, who claim that your work is too narrow in its scope. Like while women do a lot of cleaning, for example, your critic might say that men do a lot of other manual work around the house, such as mowing lawns and moving furniture, fixing roofs and rewiring plugs. Is your point that these tasks are more frequent for women and more cognitively burdensome than the male orientated jobs? Or do you think that various genders have their own jobs and burdens to bear, and it's too difficult to weigh up the costs of male and female responsibilities in the household? Well, Arlie Hochschul has written on this in the second shift. So she's a, she's a famous feminist sociologist. And she points out, even if you allow for the fact that there are just gendered tasks, the so women do more cleaning and men do more lawn mowing, there's going to be still a disparity in workload here because how often do you mow the lawn? Does it really matter whether you mow the lawn on Saturday morning or on Saturday afternoon or on Sunday morning? There's much more discretion as to when some of those traditionally male gendered tasks can be done. Whereas when it comes to changing the nappy, well, the nappy needs changing when it's dirty. It needs to change immediately. So it requires immediate attention. And many of the caring tasks, it's not just that they are more frequent, but they also don't allow for discretion as to when you take care of them. And so both of that translates into, you know, more work, work that can't really be planned ahead. So you can't really plan leisure as part of the caring workday in a way in which you can when your workload consists in rewiring electric plugs and, and mowing the lawn. The other injustice comes about not just from the disparity, but from the lack of recognition. So again, bringing it back to the invisibility point, it's the fact that this disparity in labor is not recognized. It's not acknowledged as being there. And so the person doing more of that household work, she doesn't get the credit. She doesn't get the kind of additional leisure for doing that work. That is part of the injustice of the arrangement. To break the fourth wall for a moment for listeners, I can see into both of your homes here, which seem to be very tidy, beautiful, clean and the like. Very uh, aesthetically pleasing as well. Tom, a, a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. One is, to what extent you would consider yourself responsible for how clean and tidy the, the room is that you're in at the moment? And second of all, do you have any advice for those listening who want to, that maybe they want to contribute more to, to their households and ways they can do so, which is productive in the future? Yes, yeah, so in answer to your first question, I very much feel responsible for the cleanliness of my house. In terms of advice, I'd say one important thing is this. It's not just about whether you do the job. There's a form of labor sometimes called articulation work. 
which is the job of kind of divvying out the jobs. So hoovering the house when asked is one thing, but noticing that the hoovering needing, needs doing is another. To truly take 50-50 responsibility, it's not just a matter of doing half the jobs. It's actually taking responsibility for half the jobs and not leaving it the female partners having to kind of do that divvying out of tasks. So that, that's an important bit of advice, I think. Are you just doing the jobs or are you actually taking responsibility for identifying the jobs in the first place? Just a final question from us. Paulina, when we spoke to Kate Mann about some of these issues, she said that when the woman of the household is divvying out these tasks verbally, that she's encouraged by her male partner to self-police because they know the response they might get when they ask them to do these tasks. Do you think this is where the bulk of the feminist critique comes in? There's something extra there where the man responds negatively, and so it's emotionally and cognitively tiring for the woman to keep divvying them out, and they think, oh, it's just easier if I get on and do it myself. Yeah, it's part of the kind of catch-22 in which you find yourself, right? So Tom has already picked up on one part of the story. So you can do the job or you can ignore it. Doing it costs effort. Well, you resent doing it because it's unequal. Ignoring it costs effort because the job still calls out for action. But now we've got this third part of it. If you ask your partner to do it, you'll be the nagging partner, the nagging wife. You'll kind of play into the stereotype. And that's burdensome as well. So. We've got three options and all three of them come with cognitive or emotional costs. That's a very unhappy situation. Okay, and that's a nice cheerful point to end on. Lucy, a round of concluding remarks. Would you like to kick us off? I really enjoyed reading your paper and it's been so much fun to speak to you both today. The subject of domestic gender inequality is incredibly relevant in contemporary feminist philosophy. But unfortunately, it is one which doesn't get a lot of airtime outside of conversations between friends and family members. It's so exciting to see this topic discussed seriously and in an academic context. Uh, I think your theory is promising and unique in its explanation of the invisibility question. I'm hopeful that our conversation today will encourage our listeners to reflect on their own share of labour and their perception of their share in the home. Yeah, I'd like to echo some of Lucy's remarks there. First of all, thank you both as well for what's been a really interesting conversation. I thought the paper was excellent and shed some new light on what, as Lucy said, is a really important philosophical topic. And like your piece picked up so much media attention. And as Lucy said, it's great to see these ideas receiving the engagement that they deserve because they're such important critical issues that every day weigh down on such a significant number of people. So I'm going to go away and think some more about how I can retrain my brain to accomplish some of the goals that I'd like to accomplish. Uh, Like many other people, so often I find myself hyper-focused on that task, that that paper, that lecture, that that project, that interview, and and that makes me neglect other aspects and, and people in my life. And so I try and be more focused and mindful of that. Um, although I, I can already think saying it out loud with a smile on my face that I'm, I'm going to fail in some respect. But at the same time, like, I'm left worrying that this is an even bigger problem than I first thought after reading your paper. It's not just that men are overlooking the need to do domestic chores, or just being lazy. They're literally not perceiving the affordances of these things. Like it's, it seems like it's literally changed the way they're seeing the world. And so, I don't know, it'd be great to see some empirical research on how this can be resolved in the future for the betterment of of all aspects of our lives. Now it's time for something that is for the betterment of nobody's life, and that's Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop 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 philosophy quiz. Hello and welcome to Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz, everybody's favourite part of the show. You're going to get quotes from three key figures in the history and present day of thought, and you've got to guess who this person is. So you're playing Tom, Paulina, Tom and Paulina. You're going to have quotes from, best known for his role as Heathcliff in the hit TV series Wuthering Heights, we have actor and producer Tom Hardy. In Paulina, we have everyone's favourite American televangelist 
and defender of prosperity theology, Paula White. And then we've got Professor of Philosophy at the University of Vienna and Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, Paulina Sliva and Tom McClelland. So I want to hear Tom, Paulina or Tom and Paulina. Bonus point if you can tell me whether it's Tom or Paulina in the third category. Uh, Fastest (laughs) finger first, you're all playing against each other. I'm partial to comics, cats and a good pot of tea. That's me. It's you. You have two points for that one, Tom. <laughs> the lack of carbohydrates can make you a little crazy. Tom, Tom Hardy, Hardy, I reckon. It's Tom Hardy. Give that one to Lucy because you've already got two points, Tom, and that was at the same time. <laughs> God already spoke to me. You're going to write your check to Paula White. Paula. If God tells you, give me $12.99. That is <laughs> Paula. That's too old. If I hear the phrase new normal one more time, I might just pop. I think that was me. Shoot, it's an extra two points for you there, Tom. <laughs> we will destroy Gotham, and then when it's done, and Gotham's in ashes, then you have my permission to die. Tom, Tom Hardy. Hardy has Bane. Tom Hardy. Bane. Tom Hardy. So I'll give that one to Lucy again. It's about the same time. In the New Testament, Jesus talks more about finances <laughs> Pull away. and love of God. It's Lucy. <laughs> Noise-canceling earphones. Little pillows of silence. Tom Hardy? It's not Tom Hardy. It goes to Tom... Any guesses there, Tom? Paula White? No, that's, I'm going to give no one the point there. That was Paulina. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if I had $50 million, I'd spend more time at home. Paula White. Not Paula White. <laughs> Tom Hardy? Uh, it's Tom Hardy. It means you're running away with it at five, four there, Tom. Three to go. An email is rude isn't just a matter of whether the recipient will be offended. It's a matter of whether the other person is reasonably offended by it. That would be me. <laughs> That's you, fully <laughs> two points. But ultimate one, the only thing I can do is wipe my <laughs> brush my teeth, turn up and do the best I can. Tom Hardy. And Tom Hardy. Sorry about the profanity as well. And each January, I put God first and honour him with the first substance Paul of sowing. And that's my first month's paycheck. And God always provides. <laughs> I thought that was me. I think that goes Tom, then Lucy, then Paulina. If you'd like to learn more about Tom and Paulina's work, links to their excellent paper, Gender Affordance Perception and Unequal Domestic Labour is on our website, as well as links to their wider body of work and, of course, links to their websites as well. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful soothing voices of Miss Lucy James. Thank you for listening. Dr. Tom McClelland. Goodbye. Professor Paulina Sleever. Thank you for having me. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.